This lecture is the second half of our chapter on emulsions and foams. The focus here is on the classification, formation, and stabilization of foams. The most general definition for foam is that of a material consisting of a gas phase dispersed throughout a solid, liquid, or gel. Our interest will be in liquid foams, consisting of gas bubbles, usually air, dispersed in aqueous solutions. Often the topic of foams is presented as part of a broader discussion on emulsions. There are many similarities. Nevertheless, there are also significant differences. So given the importance of foams, a separate discussion is in order. Let's begin by discussing how foams are generated on purpose or by accident. We can divide the various methods used into four general approaches. Precipitation involves changing conditions in a liquid, decreasing the solubility of a gas or gases resulting in precipitation. We see this at work whenever we open pressurized containers of carbon dioxide infused drinks such as soda or beer. The process of opening the container to the atmosphere significantly decreases the pressure, reducing the solubility of carbon dioxide and supersaturating it to the point that it begins to precipitate forming bubbles which rise to the surface. For soda, these bubbles tend to rupture and disappear rapidly. But beer contains chemicals with amphiphilic structures that can form stable, persistent foams. The presence of solid particles and more common etchings on a glass promotes heterogeneous nucleation and facilitates the precipitation process. Mixing or stirring a liquid generates waves and turbulence, which entrains and carries pockets of air into a liquid. This breaks up to form bubbles that rise to the surface to form foam. The example shown here is a generation of whipped cream. A persistent foam requires a foaming agent. In this example, whisking cream entrains air, which breaks up into bubbles. It also releases fat molecules from the fat globules in cream. These molecules help to both generate and stabilize the bubbles. Sparging or spraying is the introduction of gas into the interior of a liquid. The gas leaves an inlet as individual bubbles or as a jet that breaks up into bubbles. Froth flotation utilizes sparging. As the introduced bubbles rise, they collect and separate hydrophobic particles from the more hydrophilic ones. The foam head or froth forms at the top of the tank and can be spilled or skimmed with the isolated particles for further processing. Froth flotation is used in mineral processing, paper recycling, and wastewater treatment. It is a complex operation because it requires the use of chemicals to control foam formation and condition particles for removal. The final approach shown here is plunging. Often plunging involves a liquid jet combining with a pool of liquid. Under the right conditions, this interaction entrains air resulting in the formation of bubbles which rise to the surface to form a foam. The example shown here outlines a standard test method, ASTM D1173, used to test the ability of chemical additives to generate foam. For this procedure, a solution containing the chemical or chemicals of interest is formulated and split. A pipette holds most of the solution, and the remaining portion forms a shallow pool. The liquid jet from the pipette produces a column of foam as it enters the pool. The initial height and longevity of this column gauge the chemical's performance. The most general definition for a foam is that of a gas dispersed in a liquid. However, when we think about foams, we envision a structure consisting of bubbles often suspended on the surface of a liquid. So let's parse this out a little. There is no universally accepted classification system for bubble dispersions. Shown here is what seems to be the most commonly used designations based on bubble size. This system includes nanobubbles, submicron bubbles, micron bubbles, and macro bubbles. Superimposed on this are the approximate time scales required for the different size bubbles to rise through a liquid to its surface. That is the time required to travel about half a meter. Listed beneath the scale are various commercial foams associated with the different bubble diameters. The point here is that for most commercial operations where we are trying to produce foam, we use bubbles in the 10 micron to 1 millimeter size range. Such bubbles rapidly collect at the surface of a liquid, forming what we traditionally view as a foam. For the smaller nano and micro bubbles, which form what could be considered gas emulsions, applications in food, medicine, agriculture, and wastewater treatment are possible. Such bubbles are often referred to as entrained air in industrial operations and can cause serious problems during production. 
As mentioned, a standard method for producing a foam is to plunge a liquid into a shallow bath. This process entrains the surrounding air, producing bubbles. For pure liquids or solutions containing solutes that do not promote foaming, such as highly soluble species, formed bubbles are short-lived. They tend to rupture rapidly, usually in less than a minute. Such bubbles compose what is called a transient or short-lived foam. To produce persistent foams, whose lifetimes are measured in hours and days, even weeks, rather than seconds, requires the use of foaming agents. These are chemicals that lower the energy required to create new surface area and inhibit processes leading to film rupture. Here, the additive provides for the formation of a polydispersed collection of bubbles, which accumulate to build a column. As hydrophobic colloids, foams are unstable, and the liquid ultimately drains from their structures. Thus, the evolution of foam can be characterized using their gas or liquid volume fractions defined here. Typical gas fractions for foams range from about 65% for dilute or wet foams to over 99% for concentrated or dry foams. The critical gas fraction, which occurs for a gas fraction of around 72%, is defined where visible bubble deformation begins and bubbles start to lose their spherical shapes. For the foam column picture shown here, the gas fraction is higher than 60%, but lower than the critical fraction. As a foam evolves, its gas fraction rises. Although there is no fixed convention for labeling a dry foam, here we take it as foams above their critical gas fraction. In a column such as this, there is a significant moisture gradient over the column's height. The foam at the top of the column is drier than the foam at the bottom. This diagram outlines the evolution of foam, which begins with the dispersion of polydispersed spherical bubbles distributed in a liquid known as a spherical foam or a kugelschwamm. This stage of foam formation is short-lived because the macro bubbles and larger micro bubbles are especially prone to separation and collect at liquid surfaces roughly in the form of stacked planes composed of 60 to 70 percent gas. These layers of spherical bubbles are separated by thick films and entrained liquid. The liquid gravity drains from such structures. If not inhibited, this stage of foaming is also short-lived. Accompanying drainage is various processes driven by colloidal forces in which bubbles combine to increase their average diameter. These processes are known collectively as bubble coarsening. As the foam drains further, it moves past the critical gas fraction. The now larger, more compressible bubbles begin to press together to produce shapes that deviate from spherical. Eventually, the bubbles begin to take on more polyhedral shapes, and the films that separate them thin and flatten out. At high gas fractions, greater than 90%, a polyhedral foam, also known as a polyederschwamm, develops. Rather than a collection of spherical bubbles, such foams consist of irregular polyhedral gas cells separated by nearly planar thin liquid films or lamellae. These foams continue to drain through the thinning of lamellae assisted by a process called capillary suction. At this stage, foams can possess significant stability, even metastability, resulting from the disjoining pressure, which arises as films thin to the point that the film surfaces begin to interact. The extent of this counter pressure is a result of stabilization mechanisms described previously such as electrostatic and steric interactions that act to inhibit further thinning of the lamellae and delay film rupture. Let's go ahead and change the axis on the diagram from gas fraction to foam evolution. In terms of time, the initial stages of formation tend to be quite short-lived while the later stages can be slowed substantially with additives. Eventually, films reach the critical thickness range of a few nanometers and fail. However, with a prudent choice of additives, polyhedral foams can remain stable for days, weeks, even months. It is possible to form polyhedral foams directly. In reality, this results from the foam moving through the initial stages of formation extremely rapidly. In discussing how to either stabilize or destabilize foam, it is useful to identify the processes involved in moving it from dispersed bubbles to film rupture. These include gravity drainage and then capillary suction, which thin the film separating gas cells. Such processes, especially gravity drainage, are accompanied by bubble coarsening, which produce larger, more homogeneous bubbles. Bubble coarsening tends to increase the rate of drainage. It also results in the rearrangement of the foam structure, which places localized strains on film surfaces, often producing rupture before films reach a critical thickness. Below, we will briefly review the processes involved in the evolution of a foam structure. 
Hydrodynamic drainage is significant only for wet foams possessing thick lamellae, in other words, during the initial stages of foam formation. It is typically the most rapid stage of foam development. The process is essentially the flow of liquid, gravity-driven, through a column packed with spherical particles. Applying the carmen kozeny equation to compare flow between columns composed of monodispersed spherical bubbles provides a semi-quantitative relationship between the variables involved. Here is the form that includes the volume fraction of the gas in the foam, which we have been using to describe foam evolution. The equation indicates that the flow rate of a liquid out of the foam is inversely related to its viscosity. So additives that increase viscosity provide for some control of stability. Also, viscosity decreases with increasing temperature, so the rate of drainage increases with increasing temperature. Drainage continues until films thin to a few hundred nanometers. Over this process, the gas fraction rises, which according to the equation produces a sharp decline in the rate of liquid drainage before leveling at the inverse plateau, which could be considered a transition between a wet and dry foam. According to the model, the sharpness of this decline depends directly on the square of bubble diameter. Thus, the extent of bubble coarsening has a significant impact on the speed at which the foam drains. In summary, higher liquid viscosity and smaller particles promote slower drainage and increase foam stability at this stage of its evolution. Compared to a polydispersed collection of bubbles, dry liquid foams tend to have a much more ordered and interesting structure. In such foams, bubbles are no longer spherical. The loss of liquid results in the rearrangement and compressing of bubbles to minimize film surface area, forming polyhedral pockets of gas with nearly planar polygonal faces. These bubbles meet at joints or nodes at close to tetrahedral angles. Within a plane, the faces of the bubbles meet three at a time, forming a junction with the lamellae at relative relative angles of 120 degrees. This junction point is called the border plateau, which provides a conduit for the movement of extracted liquid to a lower layer in the foam. With the formation of a dry foam, gravity drainage provides little or no help in removing the remaining liquid. At this stage, a mechanism known as capillary suction acts to move the liquid from the structure. The perpendicular surfaces near the border plateau are assumed to be cylindrical. The pressure gradient across the film there is estimated from the young laplace equation. From the drawn curvature, it should be clear that the pressure is lower at the border plateau. As we move away from the junction along the lamellae, surfaces flatten, eliminating the capillary pressure. In these regions, there is no pressure gradient across the films. As a result, a pressure gradient exists between planar film regions and the plateau borders, which pushes liquid held in the lamellae towards the plateau border where it drains. Here's a side view of the same process with a cutout showing the intersection of a lamella. The plateau border is a junction that runs the length of the merged walls of the bubbles. As described, the drainage process involves the capillary-driven flow of liquid composing the lamellae towards the border plateau, where it collects and drains to a subsequent layer. Interestingly, larger polyhedral bubbles enhance this drainage mechanism due to the greater curvature at bubble intersections. Drainage from lamellae results in shrinkage, and once they thin to less than about 10 nanometers, the critical thickness, films tend to rupture. The use of foam additives can counter capillary drainage to promote metastability in dry foams. Such foams can exist for long periods of time when steps are taken to limit liquid evaporation. For aqueous foams, anionic surfactants, polymers, and even small particles act to bolster film repulsion and build the disjoining pressure. The mechanisms involved are those described previously during our discussion on colloidal stability. As mentioned, bubble coarsening in a foam facilitates drainage and failure. The primary mechanisms responsible for increasing bubble size in foam are disproportioning and coalescence. We have described both of these before, but there are some subtle differences when considering a foam. So let us briefly review, beginning with Oswald ripening or disproportioning. Previously, we described Oswald ripening in emulsions. The oil will have a low water solubility, but its water solubility increases with increasing pressure. As a result, as a result, the oil tends to dissolve from or leave smaller particles which have a higher capillary pressure and join larger particles which have a lower capillary pressure. For foams, the same description applies, but with the dispersed phase being gas and the continuous phase composing only a fraction of the foam, it's a little less intuitive. 
the disproportioning process takes on the appearance of smaller cells attaching and injecting their contents into larger ones through the development of shared surfaces or septums. The equation provided describes the flow of gas between two cells as such. Here, the gas flow rate is determined by the difference in capillary pressure between the two attached bubbles or cell, the area of the septum, and the permeability of the diffusion path. For coalescence in a foam, the surfaces of two foam bubbles approach and the films begin to merge. The excess liquid then drains from the forming septum region. If this region thins to below a critical thickness, the septum ruptures, resulting in the formation of a capillary bridge. This capillary bridge draws the bubbles together to form a single cell. This process releases stored energy, producing chaotic damped oscillations in the resulting structure. In addition to lowering the energy required to generate new surface area and inhibiting film drainage, surfactant species also protect against disproportioning and coalescence. The extent of this protection correlates with the strength of the interactions between surfactant species at film surfaces. We enhance such interactions with surfactants that possess higher surface excess concentrations and structures that provide for more significant hydrophil and or hydrophobe interactions. A dense surfactant layer at the surface helps inhibit bubble coarsening in a couple of ways. First, it reduces the permeability of gases, which slows disproportioning. Second, it increases surface viscosity, which slows film thinning during bubble interactions. Although increased surface interactions can limit bubble coarsening, it can also diminish stability if interactions are too strong. The gibbs marangoni effect, discussed shortly, best explains this phenomenon. The example here discusses replacing carbon dioxide in draft beer with nitrogen. Nitrogen reportedly produces a thicker, more stable foam. A potential explanation for this is bubble size. There is no reason to believe that nitrogen would initially form smaller bubbles, so differences are due to coarsening mechanisms, primarily disproportioning. This question asks us to use the lipschitz slyoff equation from the previous lecture and the physical data for the gases to support this argument, provided our data for gases at both 10 and 25 degrees Celsius. We see that the gases' diffusion coefficients are about the same, but the nitrogen has a substantially lower water solubility. Assuming all the factors other than the solubility of the gases at a flat interface are about the same, the lipschitz slyoff equation estimates that the rate of bubble growth is about two orders of magnitude higher for the carbon dioxide. It is also likely that the high solubility of CO2 affects the flavor of the beer. Up to this point, we have reviewed the initial formation and evolution of foam. Foam collapse or failure involves the loss of liquid through gravity and capillary drainage facilitated by bubble coarsening. Lamellae eventually thin down to a critical thickness where they can no longer support the gas cell and fail. This process seems quite systematic. However, not all liquids form foams. Pure liquids at best produce transient foams, and even liquids containing surface active components are often not capable of generating well-developed dry foam structures. The question is, what prevents this? Based on what we've covered so far, we're not able to answer this question, so let's address this. Keep in mind that foam formation is a chaotic process. Rather than recreate this schematically, we posted a couple of videos on the course site. Please view these. During drainage and bubble coarsening, a foam is undergoing restructuring and releases surface energy producing localized oscillations. As a result, bubbles are squeezed, rubbed, stretched, and in general strained, which can lead to rupture. These processes overlay foam development, potentially leading to failure at any point in its evolution. A film's ability to withstand localized deformations without rupture depends on its stiffness or elasticity. This elasticity is not a property of the liquid. Instead, it results from the surfactant species present at the surface. To describe how this works, consider a small region of a film that's encasing a bubble. Of course, such films are two-sided, and the added surfactant significantly lowers the tension of these surfaces. 
If we dilate this small region of the film, the surfactant concentration drops there, which increases the surface tension. This local tension increase resists film expansion with a magnitude approximately equal to the difference between the surface tension of the stretched region and the average or global surface tension of the film. This behavior is much like a spring in that the surfactant concentration continues decreasing with further stretching, producing an increase in the local tension. This resistive tension pulls back the surrounding liquid to thicken and heal the dilated area. Gibbs surface elasticity quantifies the strength of the spring-like behavior. Here it is given in terms of both surface area and the surfactant surface excess concentration. The quantity is dependent on the extent to which surface tension changes with small increases in the fractional surface area or decreases in the fractional surfactant surface excess concentration. The schematic shows a relationship between Gibbs surface elasticity and the logarithm of the bulk surfactant concentration. At extreme concentration, both low and high, surface elasticity is near zero because film expansion here results in little or no change in the surfactant surface excess concentration. Between these concentrations, the curve passes through a maximum just before its critical micelle concentration. The most useful theory for film elasticity is the gibbs marangoni model, which assumes that the surfactant gradient that results from dilation is a kinetic effect attributed to the inability of surfactants to diffuse fast enough from the bulk to replenish the surface to keep up with the dilation event. This explanation is consistent with the observed concentration dependency and its dependency on the surfactant structure. We are now in a position to answer a fundamental question. Why are pure liquids, or those containing highly soluble species, unable to form foam? The answer is that formed films from such liquids produce little or no tension gradient with dilation and thus have no elasticity. Such films will fail almost immediately. Before examining how surfactants influence foam formation and stability, we should introduce methods used to gauge this. Two of the most common methods used in industry are the Ross-Miles test, ASTM D1173, typically used with low to moderate foaming solutions, and the Waring or Hamilton Beach blender test, typically used with low foaming solutions. As described in the slide above, the Ross-Miles method uses plunging to generate foam. Here is a summary of the test setup, including equipment components, essential dimensions, and typical test samples and conditions. During testing, we empty the surfactant solution from the pipette into the solution held by the receiver to generate a column of foam. The initial column height, H0, is recorded along with changes in column height as a function of time. By convention, the most common values reported for this test are the initial foam height, H0, which is considered a measure of foamability, and the foam column height after 300 seconds or 5 minutes, which is designated H300. The ratio of H300 to H0 in terms of percentage, designated here as R300, is also commonly reported, which is considered a measure of a foam stability. Shown here is a typical dose performance curve as gauged with the Ross-Miles test. As you can see, it rises sharply at low concentrations and plateaus near the surfactant's critical micelle concentration. Listed on the right are concentrations of various surfactants required to reach their maximum H0 values relative to their critical micelle concentrations. These values are all close to 1. In general, surfactants tend to produce their maximum initial foam heights near their CMCs. This observation is why we usually compare the foaming performance of surfactants at their CMC values. However, it should be stressed that the maximum initial foam heights can vary significantly for different surfactants. In other words, when making a comparison, the surfactant with the lower CMC will not necessarily produce more foam, but it will do so more rapidly. Values reported from the Ross-Miles test for a specified surfactant concentration and set of conditions often include H0 and H300 or R300. These values are considered measures of a surfactant's ability to build and maintain a foam, respectively. Building a foam involves a generation of new surface area. The minimum work required for this is the product of the surface tension and the change in surface area. However, the time frame involved in this process is milliseconds, so the surface tension 
then is the dynamic value. As discussed previously, this would indicate that surfactants with lower maximum surface excess concentrations and or higher diffusion coefficients are better at generating foams. Moreover, because we compare foaming tendencies of surfactants at their critical micelle concentrations, the rate at which micelles break up, which is governed by their stability, can play an important role. All of this suggests that surfactants with limited interactions at surfaces and in micelles promote initial foam formation or foamability indicated by H0 values. In addition to promoting the generation of new surface area, surfactants facilitate foam formation by maintaining this area. Given the chaotic nature of foam development, a critical stabilizing mechanism for films is their ability to resist dilation and self-heal. According to the Gibbs-Marangoni theory, the elasticity of liquid films results from the gradient and surfactant surface concentration that develops when dilated. This mechanism requires an optimal surfactant concentration. It is also dependent on the surfactant diffusivity and thus the size of the surfactant in the aqueous phase. Polyelectrolytes move too slowly to heal stretch films and prevent failure, while some surfactants diffuse too quickly to allow for the film's elastic response. In other words, controlling the extent of foaming requires structures that balance foam formation with stability. Another factor in stabilizing a foam is the colloidal stability of film surfaces composing the lamellae. As we discussed, water removal from the lamellae occurs via gravity and then capillary drainage. As they thin, the inner walls of the films approach each other. As these surfaces approach within a few nanometers, colloidal interactions begin to dominate. We inhibit drainage with ionic and non-ionic surfactants and polymers as well as particles. These provide wall repulsion to generate disjoining pressure that inhibits drainage. Anionic surfactants tend to work better than non-ionic surfactants for this purpose, but combinations of both also perform well. One of the essential factors in determining foam stability is the interaction between surfactants at film surfaces. This inhibits bubble coarsening. It also enhances surface viscosity, believed necessary in preventing film rupture. However, such interactions can also be excessive, to the point that they inhibit the development of film resistance and self-healing mechanisms. With the Ross-Miles test, we can use H300 or R300 values to roughly gauge stability. Foam formation is a complex process, so we really cannot list a set of concrete rules for comparing the foaming tendencies of surfactant species. Furthermore, it is not easy to find published results from Ross-Miles testing. So for the comparisons that follow, rather than providing actual H0 and R300 values, we will indicate the species with higher values and make some generalizations. The first comparison is between two sodium alkyl sulfates, sodium dodeco sulfate, or SDS, and sodium hexadecyl sulfate. These are homologs, with the second structure having a larger hydrophobe. This increase in the length of the hydrophobe provides a second species with a higher initial foam height and stability. Next, we compare the performance of SDS in distilled water at 60 degrees C and at 25 degrees C. The H0 and R300 values are both higher at the lower temperature. Here, we compare the performance of SDS with cesium dodeco sulfate. Cesium is the more strongly bound counter ion, which provides for a slightly lower H0 value, but a higher R300 value. These examples demonstrate that changes that promote a denser surface layer and stronger interactions between adsorbed surfactants increase foam stability as gauged by R300, while having a limited impact on foamability or H0 values. H0 does tend to modestly increase when R300 increases, which may be more a reflection of the role played by film stabilization during the initial foaming process. There are also cases where there is a modest decrease, which might be connected to enhance micelle stability. Next, we compare SDS and an alcohol ethoxylate possessing an identical hydrophobe. This comparison is in hard water at 60 degrees Celsius. It demonstrates a general finding that anionics are better at generating foams than non-ionics. This result likely has something to do with the limited colloidal stability provided by non-ionics, which is required to inhibit the drainage of lamellae. It may also be tied to the greater micelle stability provided by non-ionic species. This comparison is between a primary 
and secondary alcohol ethoxylate. Both possess the same number of ethylene oxide linkages, and their hydrophobes possess the same number of carbon atoms. Reported H0 values for these surfactants are about the same, but the primary alcohol ethoxylate has a greater R300 value. This is attributable to the greater surface density and interactions that exist for the primary alcohol. The final comparison is for a nonophenol ethoxylate at temperatures below and above its cloud point in distilled water. Typically, H0 and R300 values will pass through sharp maximums at or near cloud points. Some have speculated that aggregated micelles that form above cloud points may help rupture films, acting as a defoamer, which accounts for the sharp decline. Let's finish up here with a few more observations regarding foam formation and stability. Organic additives and co-surfactants are an effective means for strengthening interfaces to inhibit rupture and coalescence. This is valid for both foams and emulsions. The most common scenario is the combining of lesser amounts of a non-ionic component with an anionic surfactant. The non-ionic fills in gaps between the anionic surfactants, which occupy large areas at the interface due to electrostatic repulsion. This filling of the interface increases hydrophobe density, enhancing their physical interactions, which helps to stabilize the colloid. Such chemicals may also displace excellent foam formers after the foam formation, resulting in both good foamability and stability, an approach likely employed in many commercial formulations. A typical organic additive for this approach is a fatty alcohol or carboxylic acid, possessing a low to moderate water solubility. Note, there are a wide variety of mechanisms by which additives can either promote or inhibit foamability. For some applications, surface active species are required, for example, to enhance wetting, but the presence of foam creates severe problems. For these situations, we can apply surfactant species designed to provide performance with little foam formation. It should be evident from the listed structural characteristics that such species will diminish foam stability without promoting foam formation. Additives designed to destabilize a foam or inhibit its formation are known as defoamers and antifoamers. However, these terms are often used interchangeably. Such additives work through a variety of mechanisms. Here we list the three most commonly identified, including removal of foam stabilizing species, usually achieved using suspended hydrophobic particles such as silica as an adsorbent, replacement of foam stabilizing species, which involves using chemicals such as insoluble oils which spread on bubble surfaces displacing the stabilizing agents and reducing film cohesiveness. These are additives designed to rapidly move to new surfaces but interact little resulting in rapid film drainage. This completes our discussion on foams. It also completes our introduction to emulsions and foams. Both of these systems are of great commercial importance and highlight critical characteristics of hydrophobic colloids. These are systems we encounter on a daily basis, but likely never realize the effort involved in their design and production. It is worth repeating that our discussion was an introduction. A number of textbooks are available on both emulsions and foams. The goal was to provide students with a basic understanding of these colloids and possibly spark enough interest that they'll pursue these topics further on their own.